This is an audio recording to uh, give you some background on the, the stratigraphic code. Uh, the stratigraphic code uh, is uh, in the appendix in your textbook. So it's Appendix A. And what you will find there is a publication that was first in the AAPG Bulletin. And um, since then, uh, it's available free to download and everything. But there are a set of rules which we follow in stratigraphy about naming rock units, about how we correlate and how we think about rock units. And so that was uh, put together by a committee called the North American Code on, Zo uh, on uh, Stratigraphic Nomenclature. And it was first published in the 1960s, as I recall, and then it's, been, it's had two iterations since then. Uh, so the information on how to name rock units, but also it's been expanded uh, to magnetic uh, units. If you, if you page on to slide two here, this should be the uh, stratigraphic code part one here. Um, if you go to pay, uh, slide number two. It lists some of the categories that we're going to talk about anyway, um, and that would be also seen in Table 1 in the code. Uh, so we're going to talk about lithostratigraphic units, which you already know about. Those are things like formations and members and groups and supergroups and also beds and tongues and so forth. So we'll talk about that, but there's actually some rules uh, that we get into a little bit more detail on lithostratigraphy. The next rock unit we're going to talk about is called lithodemic units, and lithodemic units are units that seem to violate the principle of superposition. So we'll talk about how uh, those rock bodies are named and some of the characteristics of those rock bodies. And we'll talk a little less uh, detailed about magnetopolarity, but then um, those are sort of like... Uh, rock units that have been uh, actually they're magnetic units uh, we refer to as either having normal or reversed uh, polarity and these are things like the cretaceous long normal that's an example um, and so anyway the magnetic polarity has changed through time and so how do we identify these crons they call them magnetocrons or magnetic uh, time periods and so then we'll also talk about biostratigraphy and how we identify biozones and the different kinds of biozones and the different constitution for the, the types of biozones there are. Uh, next along the list, you see pedostratigraphy, and that has to deal with sediments and, and also soils. So soil stratigraphy is important for um, agricultural purposes. It's also important in uh, geomorphology, and of course for, uh, for folks who do, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, correlation of sediments as opposed to um, rocks. And then lastly, allostratigraphy. And allostratigraphy is kind of in flux right now, but there are some rules that have been put down for allostratigraphy. In other words, it means all of stratigraphy, I think, is a, essentially a way to put it. So how do you correlate from place to place and so forth? Um, but for our purposes, we're going to probably replace allostratigraphy with what we refer to today as sequence stratigraphy. There are so many ideas about how the rock record should be interpreted and do we actually use models to predict uh, things that we see. So slide two, slide three. Um, the categories that we have uh, that are expressed also with respect to time, uh, these are categories that would be chronostratigraphic. You refer to these, of course, as, as um, uh, time periods that would be our time rock units. And so that's important, too. So, uh, for instance, you guys know about systems now. You know about uh, uh, subsystems as, as well. You know about um, the, the corresponding term for an epic as a series and stages and then also crons so and then there are also polarity chronostratigraphic units are related to the the magnetic ones that we have that are based on the rocks uh temporal categories these are ones that are not they consider them to be non-material the other two categories one and two uh, a were referred to as material categories um, the temporal ones are geochronology, and so we can get age dates, and so pol polarity chronology. So if there are time rock units that have a certain magnetic polarity, there are also time units that have that polarity. Um, diachronic units, which, you know, we're not going to go into much detail about that, and then geochronometric uh, units. And so those are different aspects of the geologic, um, the stratigraphic code that we're going to deal with. 
And so we start with the next slide, slide four, uh, lithostratigraphy. So lithostratigraphy is rock stratigraphy. It is uh, where you have a stratum or a body of strata. So strata, of course, is plural, and then there could be a body of the strata, which you may refer to then as a formation, you know, member, uh, supergroup, and so forth. Uh, these are usually layered, but not invariably. So just some of the characteristics of these uh, rock units. They are tabular. In other words, they are uh, they have a third dimension, so they not only have uh, a certain area that they cover, X and Y, but they also have a thickness associated with them, too. So that makes it more than just a planar surface. It's a tabular surface. Um, it conforms to the law of superposition. So in other words, the younger rocks overlie older rocks. Uh, lithostratigraphic units uh, will have uh, characteristics that we put into descriptions, of course. That's a composition. The texture, so the composition refer to the mineral composition. The texture, which would be the sort of uh, visible uh, features that we would see in that. The fabric, there may be a larger scale fabrics like, or sedimentary structures in that as well. And then they'll have a defining uh, color as, as well, perhaps. And we refer to the Munsell rock chart for our color descriptions. Um, and that's not something that everybody does in stratigraphy, but it's an important aspect that shouldn't be neglected. Um, and then they're de definitive. So a stratum is actually defined by the rocks that are above and below. And so that's the sort of uh, information that we try to retrieve from the rock record and, and we make our descriptions of it. So in the next slide, you see where we have a formation. And so a formation, you know this now, is a mappable rock unit, okay? That's the definition of a formation. The second part of it doesn't really define it, but it's one of the characteristics of it. And so formation is the fundamental unit of lithostratigraphy as well. And it typically we'll have a formal stratigraphic unit. Um, and when we have that, we can also have informal ones as well. But the formal ones, the descriptions and so forth, or the rules for that are more or less um, described by the um, stratigraphic code. So we can have more than one rock type within a formation. So a formation is not necessarily defined by a one type of rock. So for example, in the Grand Canyon, there's a rock unit called the Bright Angel Shale. The Bright Angel Shale is predominantly shale, but it's not exclusively shale. It also includes beds of dolomite, and there may be some sandstone beds in the lower part of it as well. So that's, you know, normally somebody would say, well, if it's not all shale, why don't you call it the Bright Angel Formation? And in places where there was a preponderance or a larger amount of dolomite or sandstone, you might prefer to call it that way uh, as a formation. But in as it's defined in the Grand Canyon in current usage, it's referred to as the Bright Angel Shale. So the Bright Angel Shale is the name of that. That's the formal name of that rock unit. So you capitalize every piece of it. So Bright Angel and Shale are all capitalized if you put it in a sentence. Um, and so in Missouri, we have the Bachelor Formation. The Bachelor Formation, it's not all shale and it's not all sandstone. There is a lower sandstone, only a few centimeters thick, a few me inches, if you will. And then also there's a shale above that. And because not, there's not one that's dominant over the other, it's referred to as the Bachelor Formation. Know that the F in formation is capitalized as well. So I'm giving you some rules right here. You've got to capitalize formation. You've got to capitalize the proper name of that unit as well. So bachelor formation is the proper name uh, for that unit. Uh, I actually was responsible for referring to the bachelor as the bachelor shale in one area of Missouri where there is no sandstone. It's like, well, why call it the bachelor formation when it's really the bachelor shale at the base of the Mississippian succession? So that's down around Jane, Missouri, where we put that on a map, and it was accepted by the reviewers in the state uh, to refer to it as the Bachelor Shale, where you're missing the sandstone now. So uh, somebody will refer to that map at some point uh, when they refer to the different names that the Bachelor has. Okay, so one little tiny uh, addition to add here. What if I was talking about two formations, and you have them in a list, let's say, 
Um, let's say the LC formation and the Reed Spring formation. Now, both of those have chert and limestone in them. But if I were to make, you know, a statement where I said, we did not find any whatever brachiopods in the, you know, we would find brachiopods in it. But uh, let's say cephalopods. We, would, we, we did not find any cephalopods in the Reed Spring and LC formations. As it turns out, you would capitalize reed, the R in reed, and the S in spring, or the reeds, and then the S in spring, and then you would capitalize the E in LC, but because they're in a list, you would not capitalize the F in formations because neither one of those units is referred to as formations. So formations is referring to a formation, which would be capitalized, or you could actually spell it out as reed spring formation, and LC formation, but that's a little redundant. So we make it lowercase and we combine the two together, recognizing that the names themselves are referring to the rock units that are formations. And so you don't capitalize it when it's in a list. Same thing goes for mountains. Same thing goes for any sort of physical feature. Uh, so if you're making a list of things at the end, you wouldn't put the formal because that only refers to one of those, right? So like uh, the Rocky Mountains, well, okay, that's not a good example. Anyway, this is the sort of thing that we deal with. It's semantics, isn't it? What is the meaning that we're trying to convey and how do we communicate our information with one another? Okay, uh, we can subdivide formations into members, of course, and members then can be and you don't even have to member, have a member, but you can have actually designate even a bed. That's the smallest unit that we have. I'll, you can refer to it as a tongue as well if it has a certain sort of like limited aspect. And so if it pinches out in one direction, may be referred to as a tongue. Um, so those are really thin, very small sort of units, but it's only a relative scale. It's a ranking, in other words. And so beds should be like one, two, three, four, maybe up to five beds, I guess you could say. And you could probably make it plural. Uh, but if you're making it a formal designation in your descriptions, you would actually refer to it with a capital B then. A uh, member is going to have a capital as well, unless it's an informal member. And so informal members, we don't capitalize them. Um, and I'll go into what's the difference between formal and informal here in just a second. And so the next slide, uh, this is going to be slide number six. And so formations are regarded as being diachronous. They tend to cut across time. So rock units don't always, they're not always of the same time. And so it's a rock body and these boundaries can cut across. As you know, rocks are deposited in facies belts, right? And if you have a conformable succession, well, sure, it's going to cut across time because if you took a snapshot of what it looked like in the Gulf Coast today, you'd see that the, well, in certain areas anyway, that you're going to have sand up close to shoreline and then you're going to have silt or even mudstones or, and even clay stones deposited farther offshore. And then beyond that, once you get into clean water and, and clear water that has enough nutrients, and if it's warm enough, you could actually deposit carbonates like in the Blossom Bank, I think it's called in Texas. So if you're far enough offshore, you can even have reefs. So in that setting where you go from sandstone to shale to limestone, those are all being deposited at the same time today. And so the rock units that will result from the deposition of the sediments today are going to be in facies belts. They cut across time. Uh, formational boundaries are known as contacts. So you, when you go from one formation to another formation in a vertical succession, that's a contact. You can take that contact, contact and walk it out and you can make a geologic map by walking out these contacts. That's the common way that it's done in Western North America where you have excellent exposure in mountain ranges. You can take and walk out that outcrop and then put it, place it on a um, topographic base map uh, without, you know, forests and things like that. And so you can make uh, notes about the formation along there, but you can actually map out the contact uh, relative to its um, elevation. So you use elevation contours to help you map out uh, the contacts often. So contact is a term that can also be referred to in faults and intrusions as well. So you can have a fault contact between two formations. Or you can have an intrusion between an intrusive rock body, which is going to not be 
a lithostratigraphic unit. It'll be a lithodemic unit, and then you would have it up against maybe a sedimentary unit if the if the intrusion came into and penetrated into a succession of sedimentary rocks. Contacts can also be sharp, or they can be abrupt. Um, and that's uh, the same thing. In other words, it implies that there's a uh, significant change all of a sudden right there. So sharp contacts and abrupt contacts may have, um, there may be a little bit of missing time there even. And so sharp or abrupt contacts is one way to think about it. The other way is if it's gradational. So if we go from one rock, one rock unit to another rock unit where it changes slowly, uh, in a vertical succession, that's going to be considered a gradational contact. And so if we go from, let's say, a conglomerate to a sandstone, maybe there's fewer and fewer pebbles, and all of a sudden you're into, let's say, in a recessive unit that tends to be a cross-bedded sandstone. All of a sudden you've changed facies, and that contact may, in fact, be gradational because of that. So maybe no time missing in a situation like that. Intertonguing or interfingering or intercalated intercalated uh, contacts can be ones that are kind of jagged, if you will. And so being jagged, in other words, like the faces that we show, tongues often, uh, oftentimes will pinch out in one direction or another. And so that's why we use the term interfingering, intertonguing, or intercalated uh, to describe that type of contact. Um, and I'm going to cut it right here and take a little break, and I'll be back to finish up the lecture in a few more segments here. So that ends slide number six here. Thanks. Talk to you in a bit. Hi, folks. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Evans again, and I'm uh, trying to give you this uh, lecture in bite-sized chunks. And I want to point out, actually, I've gone through the lecture one more time, uh, the lecture slides, and I will upload that as soon as I finish up the audio here. Um, and uh, I wanted to point out that there is a link to the stratigraphic code online on the very first page, uh, just below stratigraphy, it says the stratigraphic code. That's a hot link, and you can go then to a website from the USGS um, to be able to look at the code in detail, and you can actually search on that too. So if you find terms that you want to find actually in the text of the code, uh, you can go directly to it. So last one, when I was uh, talking with you, I talked about formations being diachronous and they have contacts and they're sharp or abrupt and they, or they can be um, gradational or they can be intertonguing, interfingering or intercalated um, uh, contacts. Uh, on page seven, I'm going to try to hustle this up a little bit. I'm taking too long uh, talking with you. So here we go. Uh, on page 7, you'll see the hierarchy of these things. Now, you've already been exposed to this, and we talked about it in class already, but here it is um, in uh, a PowerPoint presentation for you. Supergroup, group, formation, member, or lens, or tongue uh, can be uh, considered to be higher than the bed. And so each one of those, however, can be proposed as a formal lithostratigraphic unit, or they can be informal stratigraphic units as well. And we'll talk about the difference between those in just a few minutes here. Uh, on the next page, there's an example. Now, this is the same photo that you saw at the very front of this lecture and um, kind of darkened it up a little bit. Normally, in western Utah, west central Utah, it's actually, uh, usually stunning skies, but here it's a little bit overcast, but uh, I darkened it up so you could actually see the contrast with the writing and the and the um, and so forth but it in it mentions in here you can actually see at the very bottom down there it's called the Canland shale member of the ore formation now you guys are probably familiar with that already and then above that you can see the Johns Wash limestone member of the ore formation then above that the Corset Spring shale member of the ore formation then then lastly you see the sneak over member of the ore formation then above that there's a contact with the overlying Notch Peak formation, and it's the, actually the lower member, the three members of the Notch Peak formation. Hella Mariah member is the lowest. It's a dolomite. Uh, the sneak over is, uh, well, it's mostly dolomite. Uh, the sneak over member uh, of the ore formation is mostly a uh, limestone. And of course, the shale is a shale, and the, in the John's Wash is a really high energy. Um, shallow water sort of deposit with ooid grainstones and things like that at the top and stromatolites at the bottom fairly shallow water and then the canlin shale below that um, there are limestones interbedded with both the canlin and in the corset spring 
So this is a sort of interval where I worked on uh, these rocks for my dissertation. And so uh, with that sort of introduction, here you can see how people broke these units out based on their physical characteristics. And so the shales obviously show up as recessive units or slope forming units, whereas the limestones are kind of cliff formers. Now the sneak over is really well exposed here, but it's not its typical sort of exposure. It is a series of step ledges, we, we call them. And then above that, you get the massive cliffs of the, uh, of the Hill of Mariah. So really quite an interesting succession. This is all Upper Cambrian in age. Notice I used the phrase Upper Cambrian and not Late Cambrian in age. This was These are rocks that were deposited during the Late Cambrian, but because they are formations assigned to the Cambrian, they're going to be regarded as Upper Cambrian rocks. And so on to the next slide, you can see we're going to start with a whole series of um, examples here of different lithostratigraphic units. I want to talk to you about the Navajo sandstone. It's a formal lithostratigraphic unit. The next slide will give you the description of it. Uh, it's layered, mostly tabular, and it, but it varies in thickness regionally. It gets in several hundred feet thick, maybe up to over a thousand feet thick in some places. It conforms to the law of superposition in, in that it overlies the Kienta formation and it is below the Carmel formation and then also it's um, it's below the Page Sandstone and the Temple Cap Sandstone in, in various places. Now the, the Carmel formation is actually a marine unit so there was a marine incursion during uh, Jurassic time here. Um, composition it's mostly quartz aronite and there's small amounts of clay and silt in between the sand dunes because this thing was actually has some large-scale cross bedding that would indicate aeolian processes and of course it's middle jurassic in age now another way to say that is medial jurassic so some people make that distinction medial is kind of an archaic term these days that people don't use so much so regardless if we're talking about time or time rock units, middle is usually the preferred uh, designation. So uh, you could say medial, but you know, it's kind of old fashioned. Um, for the actual description in slide 10, you can see the uh, published copy on the right hand side, and that's in Gregory 1917, Geology of Navajo Country, a reconnaissance of parts of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And of course, this thing was uh, published a long time ago, over 100 years ago now. Um, it is exposed in Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah, but it was first described by Gregory. So after it was described, now this is before the stratigraphic code was actually written, uh, but this is, if it was kind of a standard practice, even before the code was written, that you would describe rock units. And so this gives a description over on the right-hand side of what the Navajo is like. Uh, on the next slide, you can actually see a photograph of Coab Canyon, which is part of Zion National Park. It's the part that runs along Highway, um, well, Interstate 15. And you can see the Kienta Formation down below, which is pretty much a recessive uh, f f unit of sandstone and shale. And then above that, the massive uh, Navajo sandstone. And then you don't quite see the top of it here, but it's, uh, it's quite massive here. Um, so, <clears throat> with this formation, uh, we're going to take a closer look now at the contact on uh, slide number um, 12 here. And you can actually see the shaley and sandy Kienta formation down below, overlain by the massive uh, Navajo sandstone above. And this is actually in Zion National Park, the, the main part of it. Um, close to Springdale, I think it is. So it's just inside of the gate and making your way. If, if you get up to the top of, um, of Zion Canyon, this is on that road that goes towards the top. Um, so that is pretty much the, uh, the Navajo sandstone. If you look at the next page, here's one of the tunnels that you cross through on the way up to the top. Um, and you can see the cross bedding in these rocks. These are actually Aeolian cross beds here, of course. A series of sand dunes that would look something like the, the lower right here, where you can actually see the Great Sand Dunes uh, National Park in south central uh, Colorado. 
And so if you took a cross section through those sand dunes, you would probably see something that resembles Zion National Park here. So the Navajo sandstone is a, is a formal unit. Uh, it's a quartz aronite with hematite staining, so the red color comes from that. There's large-scale cross bedding. It's resistant to weathering and erosion. Um, it's interpreted, of course, as Aeolian. So in science, we always try to keep those separate again, just to reinforce that. Um, it is interesting, the Navajo sandstone, just give you one small side um tidbit here of information uh the navajo sandstone has a rock formation if you go down the main part of zion canyon it's called the white throne and so the white throne is actually a white quartz aronite it doesn't have the red staining people think that is because it has um had hydrocarbons flushed through it before and so hydrocarbons would uh keep the uh, iron from actually uh you know, probably uh, rinse the iron out, I guess you could say. So it's uh, it's actually white in color. And um, I will point out also that the Navajo Sandstone is actually an oil reservoir in uh, the Covenant Field in Utah. So in places where the Navajo Sandstone is buried, farther to the north and a little bit to the central part of the state, and not in the southeast, it actually preserves hydrocarbons in it and there were like 1700 feet of closure on the navajo sandstone you, so you, you can it made a really big splash so to speak in uh, in the uh, petroleum field back when they discovered that back in the early 90s i think it was or late 80s um so another example of a rock unit would be the now uh, the uh, madison limestone or the madison group um, it depends on where you're at, which it's referred to um, as. Sometimes it's called Madison Formation. Sometimes it's a Madison Limestone. Sometimes it's a Madison Group. We're willing to accept that a rock a name and a rock that has been described can actually change its rank based on how important it is. So if it includes several different distinctive members, we're going to call it maybe a group and call each one of those members, instead of being members, then we refer to those as formations. And so you can actually change the rank. Uh, it is a formal unit. Uh, it changes rank geographically, as I just mentioned here. It's layered, mostly tabular again, so it has some finite thickness to it. And it's relatively thick, in fact, in uh, across much of Wyoming and on into parts of uh, Montana as well. And in fact, it even crops out in places. It has a different name, but it crops out even in Utah uh, in a few localities as well. Actually, it is in uh, northeastern Utah. It goes by a different name when you're in western Utah. Um, it conforms to the law of superposition again. It is above the lodgepole formation or the Darby formation. Now, the lodgepole is Mississippian in age and the Darby. So the lodgepole is one of these where you break it out and it's part of a group. So the lodgepole sometimes is referred to as a member of the Madison group or, or the, excuse me, of the Madison limestone. Or at times, it's actually referred to as the lodgepole formation and you get the Madison over the top of it. And so people split them out. So the lodgepole is a little bit less resistant. I spent a summer working on the uh, Madison limestone back in the early 90s. Uh, the Darby Formation is actually Devonian in age. And so it is um, a unit that um, is, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's mostly carbonate. It's very shallow water. Uh, but it's equivalent, uh, in fact, to much of the uh, part of the late Devonian, anyway, uh, complex of different kinds of depositional environments that were across North America at that time. Uh, the Amsden Formation above the um, is, is actually Pennsylvanian in age, and it contains some evaporites. And so there's actually evaporites in places, even in the Madison limestone. Um, the composition, it's mostly limestone. It varies from lime mudstone to grainstone, but lesser amounts of siltstone in a, little, in a few places, especially like in the lodgepole formation. Uh, it's present in Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Utah, and, and Wyoming, and in the subsurface in North Dakota, and uh, I don't know what NE stands for there. What is that? Oh, Nebraska. Yeah. So anyway. That is the uh, extent of this thing in the subsurface. So if you ever hear about the Bakken Shale, uh, the Madison limestone should be below the Bakken Shale wherever you find it. And so it could also be a target for uh, petroleum exploration. And in fact, that's what I was doing in western Wyoming, was looking for a, uh, working on a gas play in the, uh, in the Madison for mobile. Um, so it's Mississippian in age. 
And so the next slide shows you an area. Uh, there's a there's a part of uh, of of uh, Montana that's called Three Forks, and three rivers come together there to form the Missouri River. So this is a photograph of the Missouri River with the Madison limestone uh, cropping out up above a uh, a railroad. And so there's a slight railroad cut there, but most of that's actually outcrop. And so you can see the limestones are slightly inclined here. And uh, the three rivers that come together, the Gallatin, the Jefferson, and the, let's see, what was the other one? The Gallatin, Jefferson, is the Yellowstone, maybe? Yeah. Anyway, this is uh, very near the type area for this. So type area should become something that you will become, well, it's something you'll become familiar with. So every formal stratigraphic unit has a type area, and then it also has a type section. And so the type area is within that area. It's very close, in other words, to where the type section is or the stratotype for the Madison limestone. Now, the next slide shows you the Madison limestone when it's been uh, tectonically uh, disturbed, I guess you could say. This is where the Madison limestone, there's the sign that pointed to it in Sheep, Sheep uh, Creek Canyon. Now, this is in northeastern uh, Utah here, and we had gone through uh, the canyon and were coming and parked on the side over there, kind of had to do a uh, turnaround, but you can see the Madison limestone here. It has a slightly different character than what it is in Three Forks, but uh, you can see it on end here next to some Precambrian rocks on the left-hand side, and to the right, there's a whole series of, uh, of younger rocks out that way. So that is the Uinta Uplift, in fact. This is the area that's on the northern flank of that, close to Flaming Gorge uh, Reservoir. So this is kind of a unique area for the Madison Limestone. Um, on the next slide, you can actually see it where it is north and west of Yellowstone. And this is a place where it's very highly tectonized. Uh, this, remember, is along the western margin of North America. When you get much farther west from this, it becomes a very deep water facies, but it's still relatively shallow water here. And this is at uh, Big Sheep Creek Canyon, and this is in the Beaverhead Mountains of Montana. So the Beaverheads, in fact, are famous for a meteorite impact as well. So, uh, But here you can see most of the bedding here is actually perpendicular and um, you, you're actually looking at the top or bottom of these beds, but they've been slightly folded as well. But that's a Madison. More limestone, right? Okay, in the next slide, we're going to a more, um, ba it's, it's more shoreward or, or landward, if you will, but it's still covered by ocean water during uh, Mississippian time. And you see in slide 18, uh, Tensleep Canyon in the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming. And the Madison's just one of the carbonate units that crops out here. Uh, but this canyon is, uh, oh gosh, 10, 15 miles long, running out of the Bighorns, and all the beds here are not highly deformed like they were in the Beaverhead Mountains. But, uh, but in fact, they're a, a conformable succession. Uh, you get the Devonian here, just a slight bit of it, and then you get uh, below that some Cambrian and Ordovician, so we're missing the Silurian essentially here. Um, on the next slide, it's actually annotated. That's one of the old reports on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side is something of a, a postcard, and it actually has an identification then on the, on the right-hand side, which shows you the relative ages of these things. And so you can see CU on the right, the far right, and this is slide 19. CU refers to Cambrian undifferentiated, and that would include, in fact, the Gallatin, and then down below the Gallatin, the Grovant Formation. You've seen some samples of the, uh, of the Grovant Formation. The Gallatin's relatively, uh, uh, it's mostly limestone, and it's uh, fairly um, resistant to weathering, and so it forms the lower part of that cliff. The, uh, above that, you get the Bighorn uh, Formation, the Bighorn Limestone, and so the bighorn also massive above that, so it's carbonate on carbonate sort of succession here. And then above that, you can see that sort of slope former in the middle. Well, that's the Darby formation, which is Devonian in age. And then above that, then you get the, the lodgepole member, actually, of the Madison uh, limestone there. And if you look over on the, the left-hand side, you can see some of these uh, same units through here. And um, so anyway, the Madison's at the very top up there. So it, it actually breaks it out into A, B, C, and D uh, units there on the left-hand side. 
So you can do it informally that way as well. So in the next slide, uh, slide 20, it was proposed as a formal formation back in 1893 near Three Forks, Montana. Um, and so you can actually, um, it gives some of the age there. It spans the Kinderhookian, which is the lower series of the Mississippian. And, and it goes through the Merrimackian uh, series, which is above the Osage. And so it spans three of the four, at least partially uh, three of the four um, series within the the mississippian it's partly correlative with the red wall limestone it's the it's the equivalent of our local rocks as well the burlington keokuk here in missouri um so and again here's that slide of the type area and if you go on so how do you name these rock units it's not just little stratigraphic units that get named i guess but you know it's um but the intent is to make it a formal unit whenever you name a unit and so the the designation, you have to give it a rank, you have to give it a category. So is it a formation, is it a member of a separate formation, and so forth. You have to pick a strata type. Uh, so the strata type is based on the exposure of the rock. You can even use core in some situations. There are rocks that do not crop out at the Earth's surface that are really pretty important. So an example of that would be the uh, Jurassic smack over uh, limestone in southern Alabama, it just doesn't crop out anywhere at the surface, and yet it's a very important oil reservoir. So they've described it from core in order to talk about it as the Smackover. And so it's named, I think, after Smackover, Arkansas, and the southern part of Arkansas. Um, another uh, important thing to keep in mind here is that um, when you define these things, you have to describe them as well. And you have to describe the boundaries, what overlies it, what's below it, and what's some of the historical background for that rock unit. Is it a shallow uh, marine deposit that might be enough to get away with the uh, description of the Madison limestone because it has such a large extent. Um, so you want to talk about also the dimensions of it, you know, how wide, how far does it go? In other words, how many states does it cross into geographically? What's its geologic age? What correlations can you make with it? Um, and again, the, the possibility of what its origin might be, and then it has to be published. Has to, that's why I put it in bold here. It has to be published in a rec recognized scientific medium. In other words, in the old days, it had to be in a geologic report. More recently, of course, in the last 50 years or 100 years, well, 60 or 70 years, you can publish these things in like the GSA Bulletin or something like that, but it has to be recognized and fairly widely distributed as well. And then it has to be available for comment, and so people have to say, is like, no, 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 you can't say that because, and then they'll give their explanation of why they think that your interpretation and maybe even your descriptions are wrong. So that's why it's important, because other people are going to see your descriptions at some point. And so you have to be able to, like, you know, get up and get your back up against the wall and defend yourself when it comes right down to it. Um, so uh, slide number 24, uh, the names are compound. In other words, there may be two parts, like Madison and Limestone. There's a geographic component. That's the first part. So it's named after, well, it's the Madison River, actually, as I think about. So the Madison, the Gallatin, and the Jefferson come together to form the Missouri. So they named it after the Madison because it's on the Madison branch of the Three Forks. Um, so the geographic component then um, is combined with whatever the rank is. And so the rank can be a formation, or you can call it limestone, or whatever type of lithology it is. And so that's kind of a convenient way. So some more examples would be the Wasatch Formation, which are named for the Wasatch Mountains in Utah. They're Paleogene in age. The Viola uh, Limestone, which is close to Viola, Oklahoma, is Upper Ordovician in age. You already know about the Burlington Limestone. It's named for Burlington, Iowa, and it's Mississippian in age. And then the Keokuk, of course, is named for Keokuk, Iowa, and it's Mississippian in age as well, overlies the Burlington. Um, so when you select these names, they have to be based on permanent features. So the river's not going to go away. The Wasatch Mountains are not going to go away in human <laughs> time scales. And in fact, uh, Ke Keokuk and Burlington will not be, you know, everybody's going to know where those places were. And so we have to take a place that is based on a permanent sort of feature, whether it's a town, whether it is a mountain range, or whether it's a river. 
uh, can fall into disuse. So when people stop publishing on something or they don't want to recognize it, they don't mention it. And so if it falls into use, it can be abandoned. And then we have to follow the rules of priority. Whoever named that rock unit first, that's what it gets named. Now, there are reasons. So some people have suggested that, you know, because the Burlington and Keokuk are so far away from southwestern Missouri, maybe we ought to name it something else. And some folks have actually proposed the name Bentonville Limestone for that rock unit. And, of course, that doesn't seem right to name a rock unit in Missouri after a large city in northwest Arkansas. So there's a little bit of resistance to uh, actually adopting the name Bentonville. Some people have proposed the name Springfield Limestone, which seems to make a lot more sense, at least to people who live in southwestern Missouri. So there is a little bit of state uh, rivalry when it comes to naming these rock units. And so sometimes, in fact, you'll learn that there are things called state line faults. And so rock units don't necessarily cross state lines because different geological surveys may recognize different packages of rock. So it's important to try to get our our, uh, communications across uh, to one another. Okay, now there is a search engine that will give you... Uh, the valid and formal geologic names or stratigraphic names for lithostratigraphic units, and that's the MG, or excuse me, NGMDB, and that's a, a name database, I guess. Uh, and, and so it's a uh, Geolex is what it's called. So if you just do a search on Geolex, it's going to take you both to the stratigraphic names or it'll take you to a site where you can recognize the... Uh, the, uh, the geologic maps of a, of a certain area as well. So Geolex is kind of an important website. It's, it's uh, done by the USGS. So um, here's a little exercise for you. Uh, what states have the Dakota sandstone? It's more than just the Dakotas, in other words. Uh, what's the easternmost state? What's the westernmost state? So there's a little bit of geography involved in this. So we're really looking at the aerial distribution of a rock unit that's been mapped, right? We talk about formations. Well, they're mappable rock units. They have a geography. So what's the status of the Beaverhead Granite is another question. And so um, that's a separate question from the previous one. And say, how many Cretaceous units are listed for Utah? And so you can just type in or hit the button for Cretaceous, and it will list all the Cretaceous. And there's quite a few of them in Utah. And then uh, what's the age, for instance, of the Flathead Sandstone? These are all different uses for that website. And so uh, we can compare notes and maybe go over that in uh, one of our labs where we're actually in class. Uh, On the next slide, and this is going to be slide 26, it's the Wasatch Formation in western Wyoming. It's an example of what we were talking about previously. It's Paleocene in age. Uh, This is western Wyoming, however, and not in the Wasatch Mountains, which crop out in... Uh, central Utah, yeah, but it's the same age essentially. And what you're looking at here is a pile of <laughs> rocks. It's a conglomerate, and it's related, of course, to the um, to the severe orogeny. And so that's the Wasatch Formation where it crops out in uh, in western Wyoming. Uh, the next slide shows you a photograph of. Uh, granite at the bottom that's the pinky sort of rocks and then the flathead sandstone above that and this is near Cody Wyoming so if you if you drive west from Cody Wyoming you're going to go by uh, these road cuts and you can actually see the nonconformity in the next slide you can see the nonconformity where there's a a nice sort of body right in the middle of this uh, surrounded by the granite and then you see this sort of wavy or undulatory uh, unconformity above the crystalline basement rocks. That makes it a nonconformity. Uh, it's kind of shaly at the bottom, but it's sandy above that, and so it's uh, it's called the Flathead Sandstone. Um, in number 28, uh, I'm going to give you one last example now for um, the uh, lithostratigraphic units. There's a rock unit in Antarctica that I've recently been working on, and it was named the Patuxent Formation, and it was named for the Patuxent Range. Now, in Antarctica, you don't have very many names that you can use for features because the maps were only made in the 1950s and the 1960s. And so in the mid-1960s, the uh, Schmidt and Ford had introduced the idea of Patuxent Range for Patuxent Naval Air Station in, um, in Maryland. It's right next to the Patuxent River. 
There is a Patuxent formation, however, also in Maryland, and so it's probably not a good idea. I don't know that they checked this back in 1965, but of course there's a huge geographic separation, so nobody, and they're different ages as well, so um, so people don't really uh, have kind of turned a blind eye to the fact that it probably shouldn't be named Patuxent Formation. Now, the Patuxent Formation in Antarctica has... Uh, a felsite member, which is a volcanic tuff, essentially, so it it has some of that, but it also has turbidites and pillow basalts and things like that. It's regarded as a relatively deep water sort of setting uh, for these rocks. It's over 10 kilometers thick. The base is unknown, and it's covered by snow and ice, and it's overlain, at least in the Neptune range, by the Nelson limestone. Uh, it's Middle Cambrian in age, so we know that it's pre-Middle Cambrian, uh, at least locally here. Now, it had been assigned a Precambrian um, age by in the original description, so the Patuxent formation was unusual. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. When I was in Antarctica, we went to the uh, type area for the Gorecki felsite member, and we found clasts of, of Paleozoic limestone, probably derived from the Nelson limestone, but it's uncertain. We only know that the fossils that were contained in those Paleozoic limestone class indicate that it's Paleozoic. So we found things like sponge spicules, which are not very distinctive for identifying a uh, a time period. And, and, and also we found things like hyaliths. Hyalith is a type of mollusk that's extinct now. So it was probably lower Paleozoic uh, for its age. Uh, but we also uh, collected some rocks for zircons from this, and they yielded an age of about 502 plus or minus 3 million years, which puts it into the Cambrian. So if the Gorecki felsite is Cambrian and the Gorecki belongs to the Patuxent formation, that means that the Patuxent must be Cambrian as well. Right? You would think, right? So turbidites in the eastern part of the Neptune range, however, are cut below the Nelson limestone. So it must be that 502 must predate the uh, Nelson limestone, you would think. So my advisor, when I was at KU, proposed a new name for those rocks that are in the eastern part of the Nelson, uh, the crop out below the Nelson limestone, where we know it's shallow water there. And uh, they're cut with angular discordance, so it's an angular inconformity above which we, below which we called it the Hannah Ridge Formation, for the where the rocks crop out, the rocks below the Nelson Limestone. So the Nelson Limestone may in fact correlate with the Gorecki felsite, since we're having class and volcanics that are Cambrian in age as well being deposited off farther offshore. So um, my advisor had proposed the name that. The Patuxent Formation, in a restricted sense, uh, is definitely younger than the Nelson Limestone because you have class of the Nelson Limestone in the Gorecki, then it must be slightly younger than that. And, of course, the Gambacorda Volcanics in the southern part of the Neptune Range, in fact, are um, probably the source for the volcanics as well, too. So if you look at the next uh, slide here, you can see a an image of what it looks like in the Neptune range. So there's an ice fall on the left, on the right hand side, and on the left hand side of that ice fall, there's a whole series of uh, finger-like projection or ridges out this way, and Hannah Ridge is one of those. And then farther off uh, across the Roderick Valley here, you can see two um, areas: the Schmidt Hills to the north, and you can see Mount Gorecki is in part of the the Schmidt Hills there. Um, if you look to the left of this on another map that was drawn um, at the far south of these mountain ranges that are shown in black on that map is the Patuxent Range. Now that's the type area for the Patuxent. Next slide. This is a, an image that was put together that shows the relationship of the Patuxent with the Nelson and with the uh, Gamma Corda Volcanics here. So it indicates it has to be Cambrian in age from the Zircons but it has to post-date then the Nelson limestone. That's the idea, at least, that my advisor had tried to show. And so on the next photograph, you can actually see a photograph. Next next slide, you can actually see a photograph. This is slide 33 of the Gorecki felsite, uh, where it crops out in Antarctica. So there are rocks in Antarctica. And the next slide beyond that is a, a map of 
the patuxent range. And so the patuxent range, if you've got all of that material, that's the type area for the patuxent. There's also Nelson limestone down there. So what's the relationship between the Nelson limestone and the patuxent here? Should all of the patuxent formation in the patuxent range, should it be regarded as Hannah Ridge formation? That's the big question. So um, next, photo, uh, next uh, slide shows another photograph of what it looks like. And if you look very carefully at the far right-hand photograph, now this is composite. I was standing up on an ice, uh, kind of a, like at the top of an ice shelf, if you will, looking across a wind scoop, and then you can see the rocks crop out. That's the very bottom of the succession down there. You can actually see a person, a very tiny black dot that has legs on it. <laughs> Uh, on the right hand side there and uh, those are all limestones for the most part all the way up to the very top several um, hundred feet of, um, of the Nelson limestone here so so the question is of course uh, can you refine redefine rock unit names of course you can uh, if you find new evidence we can go in and try to do some housekeeping and try to clean up what people think about different rock units okay now it's time for another break and i'm going to download this and upload it to blackboard and uh, i'll be back to talk about lithodemic units next thank thanks bye all right we're back with uh, the third part of the stratigraphic code lectures and uh, this is one long PowerPoint presentation with several audio files to, um, to help guide you through it. And so the, we're going to talk next about lithodemic units. And so we're on slide 36 here. I'm going to try to speed up a little bit because I know <laughs> there's already 50 minutes of lecture here. So here we go. Lithodemic units seem to violate the law of superposition. Now you can figure this out because you know that anytime you have a rock, that's intruded by something else or if there's an injection of other material into it that it will not overlie necessarily that rock it's going to be emplaced in the middle of it right so when that's the case when you have a younger rock unit which intrudes into another rock um, it's going to be regarded as a lithodemic unit and so one of the things that you can maybe think about um, with this is that you could have salt domes salt domes would actually penetrate through the stratigraphic column and, um, and generate some uh, structure, but also be younger than the rocks that surround them. And so, but maybe not even piercing the surface, however. Uh, mud, mud diapirs are almost the same thing as salt domes. Uh, you don't always have to have um, uh, light minerals. You could have light muds that could pinch through or, or get pushed through uh, a succession also. Um, and then lastly, you can actually have injection breaches as well. Uh, even igneous rocks could be a part of the lithodemic unit and uh, uh, designation. And so these things follow more or less the same rules as the lithostratigraphic units, except the names change. So in the next slide, in slide 37, you can see here the hierarchy of lithodemic units. Uh, so they only have three now. So remember on the other one, we had group, supergroup, all that sort of thing, right? Sweet is a group of lithodemes. Those are the lithodemic units. In a super suite, when you have a whole bunch of different suites that are in, incorporated into a rock uh, succession, primarily thinking of, in this case, crystalline rock. So lithodeme, of course, is the smallest unit, so it becomes the fundamental unit of lithodemic stratigraphy. So lithodeme, suite, and super suite are the three hierarchy. That's the hierarchy ranging from smallest at the bottom. So there's nothing smaller than lithodeme. And then it goes to suite, which would be a group of lithodemes. And then you would have a super suite above that um, in rank. Uh, next photograph shows you um, the Black Canyon of the Gunnison, which is a, a really hard rock sort of setting right there in southwestern Colorado. Um, you have a lot of Precambrian rocks here, and it gives you the stratigraphic details over on the right-hand side here. But these are all going to be uh, lithostratigraphic units until you get to the very top up there where you see the Entrada Sandstone and the Pony Express. Remember, those are lithostratigraphic units at the very top. But the lithodemic units down below can also have unconformities and things like that. But notice that they just call these things like the, uh, well, there's an example here of the, of the um, gosh, I'm having a hard time seeing it. It looks like Coarse Canyon, nice. And then there's also the, uh, 
Yeah, this is it's too small for me to read here. But uh, anyway, those are lithodemic units at the bottom, and they cross cut older limit, uh, lithodemic units, of course, and that's what the photograph shows over on the right hand side here as well. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is the last slide for lithodemic units, so it makes it a little bit easier this way. Here you can see a whole bunch of lithodemic units in the uh, sandwich between an unconformity and uh, a fault here. And so uh, everything's pretty messed up until you get up to that second major unconformity. And I think that's given the designation II. And above that, you can actually see the lithostratigraphic units were deposited. So all of the letters A, B, C, D, E. Uh, I'm looking for F here. F should be around somewhere. I don't see it. But here's G. And, uh, and there are the lowercase I and uh, lowercase h in here as well. So those are all within the lithodemic succession. Then there's the uh, unconformity marked with an ii, and then there's a, is a, a contact, uh, j, which uh, separates that conglomerate, which is on the left-hand side, and within facies uh, relationship with a uh, sandstone on the right-hand side, and then you get a shale above that. So those are the lithostratigraphic units, only at the very top up there. Um, so that's lith lithodemic units in a nutshell. Next photograph. Next photograph. So these, um, if you'll notice, I've tried to put the lithodemic units in yellow. I've had the lithostratigraphic units in white. Uh, so now we're dealing with a different uh, type of stratigraphy that the code applies to, and that's magnetostratigraphy, so I put these in blue. And what you see here is a photograph of a couple of guys next to a lake, which is very convenient because they have to use water in that rotary drill that this guy is holding in his hands right there. It's something like a... Uh, like a, a chainsaw, but we are eight, we have one of these actually at Missouri State. It's like a chainsaw, but it has a rotary drill bit attached to it here. And so the guy's got his ear earmuffs on. His colleague should have earmuffs on, but I don't I can't tell that he does. And uh, he's pumping the water up to keep the water pressure. And so you have to cool the drill by uh, applying water to it. And so they're right next to a lake, so it's easy to refill the water there. Um, he's collecting cores, little tiny short cores in order to put them into a, a magnetometer, and a magnetometer can then tell him what direction the mineral grains are pointing. The magnetic mineral grains in that rock will be pointing. So it's very important that he not only drills these rocks to get the cores out, he has to take orientations on those cores, so those and he records the information on each one of the cores that way uh, to be able to determine what its paleomagnetic signature is. Okay, so the next slide. Earth, if you didn't know it already, is a magnetic dipole. Essentially, we have a north and south pole. They're both on the same side of the um, of a, on the same hemisphere. However, so it's slightly bent, if you will, and it moves around a little bit. So it rises likely from the inner and outer core, which move relative to one another, setting up a sort of magneto, if you will. So we have a magnetic field which protects us from solar radiation. The polarity and the strength of that, medic, uh, that magnetic field is in flux. And so in other words, flux means it can change. And uh, it's varied through time, as we know. So north has not always been north on a, mag on a compass, if you will. Uh, it has been for the last 800 and some thousand years, however. So, but it is um, subject to change, and so it can change, and we don't really understand it very well because nobody was around 800 and <laughs> some thousand years ago with scientific instruments anyway to be able to figure out what was going on. Uh, so the magnetic, magnetic, magnetically susceptible mineral grains in the sediments record the ambient magnetism of the environment the polarity, and the inclination. So if you think about spreading iron filings out on a bar magnet on a piece of paper, you would see that, that the grains would line up around the perimeter of that. And in fact, they would go into uh, and point towards that North Pole at some point. And so the inclination would be parallel with the surface of the Earth right at the equator. But when you get in the northern hemisphere, the magnetic grains will dive into the Earth, essentially. And so we look at that sort of inclination to tell us what the latitude is, the paleo latitude, if we, if we can get at it. Um, so the magnetic susceptible grains could include things like magnetite, or you could have hematite, and sometimes gertite. And so there's a handful of minerals that we can use to record that magnetic signal. And it's on, in almost every rock. Even the carbonate rocks tend to have some component of magnetic rocks. 
Now, there are certain things that can affect the magnetic uh, signature as well. One of those is compaction. So if you compact the rocks, and so there are assumptions that are made about how much you compact or decompact the rocks, and you guys are familiar with decompaction now. So if you compact the rocks, of course, it, if you take that inclination, it's going to flatten it out. It won't change its orientation to north, but it will change its apparent position relative to north. Okay, this is mostly used in sedimentary and igneous rocks uh, where these changes are recorded. And so, for example, when you learned about, um, well, okay, next slide is to sh just to show you the magnetic uh, dipole, essentially, that runs through the Earth. And so s south and north are shown there as magnetic axes, but it's slightly offset from the the north uh, pole, and it's actually uh, slightly different from the, the rotational axis, obviously. So the, the geographic north pole is that rotational axis. There's a, a north, geo, uh, north magnetic pole, and then there's a north geomagnetic pole. And so um, they're showing you what that is over here on the left-hand side. And So I don't quite understand what the difference is between a magnetic pole and a geomagnetic pole, but I know today... Um, I guess the the north magnetic pole would be the extension of where you would take that bar magnet and take it out to the surface. That's where it should be. But the actual geomagnetic pole is uh, variable and moves around quite a lot. And so that's in northern Canada today. Uh, I think it looks like it's on Baffin Island right there. But it is not at that same location right now. I think it's much, much uh, farther to the west, in fact. Uh, so what you're looking at here is um, a manifestation of that. In the next slide, you can actually see the wandering of that geomagnetic pole through time. And they're showing it a little bit farther south uh, from where it was. But back, back 200 A.D., it was over in northern Russia. And so about 1220 A.D., it was a little bit above uh, uh, Iceland. And you can see it's made this long and dramatic trek over the last... 1700 year 1800 years here uh, across the uh, the Arctic so that's the geomagnetic pole and that's the one we're concerned about uh, recording the information of magnetism in the rocks so uh, if we go on to the next slide here's a list of magnetic minerals that will record the uh, magnetic polarity and that's magnetite hematite perotite pyrotite and gertite and limonite weekly, and then ilmenite uh, weekly, and always when it's heated, apparently. And there's uh, several others that uh, have this, but you can see that there's a, a uh, iron component in many of these rocks. And so there are three uh, basic, well, four basic magnetic types of uh, polarity. There's paramagnetic um, properties, there are ferromagnetic properties, there are anti-ferromagnetic properties, and ferromagnetic. So you can see one of these is spelt with an O and one with an I. And um, I guess what you're seeing here is all the grains lining up in the ferromagnetic rocks. Those are um, where they tend to be a little bit stronger, I guess, in their, in their magnetic signature. And uh, sometimes you can get, you know, it's all related to paired electrons and you guys know a little bit maybe about the physics of this and it's been a lot of years since I've ever studied about magnetism so anyway uh, if you have pairs they're going to have one spinning one way and one spinning the other way uh, in some cases and so when the spins are opposite of one another you're going to have the anti-ferromagnetics that's going to give you a weaker signal I guess um, and then sometimes uh, the spin is a little bit higher or lower and that's where you get the ferromagnetic and the paramagnetic. Um, looks a lot like the anti-ferromagnetic, doesn't it? Oh, well. Um, if you heat the rocks up, they're going to change the polarity. And so you're going to actually back off some of the, it's like peeling an onion, if you will. And so they reduce the polarity, reduce the amount of magnetism in the rock slightly. But it's an older signature that's kept um, in the rock as you heat it up. And so there's a, there's a thing called the blocking temperature, and the blocking temperature is this idea if you heat uh, beyond a certain point, you're going to reduce all the ambient magnetism that's within that grain and get back at what its original um, signature was. 
Yeah, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, the next slide here shows you the magnetic domains that could be within a rock as well. And uh, if you apply a, a magnetic field to it, they're going to line up. And so um, this one has, of course, several domains in that grain. And so you'll get a mixed uh, field out of that. Okay, so how is this applied? Um, you may, may be familiar with the magnetic stripes on the seafloor, and they show a polarity north and south through geologic time related to seafloor spreading. So every spreading center is going to have some symmetry around that spreading center, and that's what the, the bottom left-hand side shows you is the, uh, the magnetometer's reading of what is north and what is south from those rocks. And, of course, the seafloor has basalt, and basalts are rich in iron. Uh, because they're mafic rocks, and so iron and magnesium. Uh, so the rock magnetism that we have in these sort of features, um, this is slide 48, you can also get it in sedimentary rocks as well. And so the folks who do this sort of study, it's called paleomagnetism. It's an ancient rock magnetism, in other words. And the protect, uh, pr practitioners of this are by anybody who's not a paleomagnetic uh, specialist would be called paleomagicians. Okay, so there's some skepticism that people apply to this technique, but they're, it's a very useful technique for reconstructing how plates uh, relate to one another. And so folks who look at the um, sweat and the osmex and those sorts of hypotheses want to get paleomagnetic uh, signatures out of the rocks. So the magnetism is affected by compaction, as I said already, but also the heat. You want to keep it below a blocking temperature, uh, or the blocking temperature would actually, you know, nullify um, anything above that would nullify the uh, the magnetic signature. You can do it in steps, however, and so you can remove the ambient. Like today, we're pointing north towards Baffin Island. There's a signature that's in every magnetic rock that's going to point there. But you can remove that uh, in a couple of ways. You can heat it up or you can cool it down. And so there are uh, techniques that are uh, well beyond me, really, but uh, they, um, they're they used to remove the, uh, the more recent uh, magnetism that has affected those grains. So they call what's left the remnant magnetism. The remaining magnetism, it's not like remnant, like a garnet, gar garment remnant, but it is the remnant or the remainder of the magnetism that's left behind, and so that's called uh, remnants. And it's uh, if you take off the external, the current external field. And so many people who work in this sort of technique have to have shielded uh, laboratories where they, you can reduce the, the effects of magnetism uh, on the samples. And the magnetometer, of course, is the type of instrument that's used to measure the magnetism. Okay, in the next slide, it shows you the various types of magnetism that can be acquired uh, in these magnetic grains. You can have natural uh, remnant magnetism, or you can have thermal remnant magnetism, a TRM. Uh, chemical remnant magnetism, CRM, and it's not to be uh, characteristic, uh, not to be confused with the characteristic remnant magnetism, which is CHRM. And that's what some people do with impact structures, I know. So the CHRM is what uh, has been used at Decaturville and Wablo and a few others. So if you recall, if you've been on the Wablo trip or the Decaturville trips, you will have seen core drills that are in some of the outcrops there, especially in the conglomerates or in the folds. And uh, these are folks who have collected samples to try to get at the characteristic remnant magnetism that's there. There's also something known as the viscous remnant magnetism. And so I think that's the later stages. Uh, so what's the, the more recent sort of effects of magnetism? And then there's the DRM or the depositional remnant magnetism as well. If you want to see more uh, details on that, you can go to that website that's uh, linked there. On the next page, you can actually see Shannon Doolin from the University of Oklahoma drilling into a chert, which is a really hard substance. She was working a, a very difficult here. Actually, Shannon has the uh, do-rag on in this photograph, and her field partner is in the red shirt here drilling. Uh, the two, lady, uh, two women are, are drilling the uh, and collecting the samples while the men are standing around behind. And... I didn't want to look like I was just standing around not doing anything, so I wandered off to take photographs of them working. Um, so Shanna Doolin uh, finished her master's and Ph.D. at the University of Oklahoma looking at impact structures. That photograph on the right-hand side is actually the Crooked Creek structure. 
Um, but she published on the Decaturville, and she's published on Wablo as well. So they try to do these things called the fold test or the conglomerate test. And, in, and essentially, if you have rocks that are folded, and if they had already requ- uh, acquired their magnetism, if you folded those rocks, they would be inclined at different directions. Um, but did the folding actually then affect the magnetism is, is the question you would ask. Was the magnetism acquired after the folding? And so the top one, it was acquired before the folding. That's layer A there. Layer B, it was acquired afterwards. And so that's the test that you would do with the fold test. The conglomerate test is much like that. If you can imagine, if you have several class that are within a conglomerate, um, they should all be pointing in various different directions, right? It's because the class, there's no way to know what their orientation is relative to one another um, in, the, in the original uh, magnetization. But if they're all magnetized in the same direction, that means that the magnetism was acquired after the conglomerate had been deposited. And so was it before or was it after the conglomerate was deposited? So they try to get the class. And so the class are really important for that because the class should have a random orientation. If you can throw out that idea, then the magnetism was acquired after the uh, whatever made that breccia or whatever made that conglomerate. That's why it's good for impact structures. Okay, next slide uh, shows you the paleomagnetic poles. You can see the ge- the magnetic north pole again. You see the geomagnetic or the geographic pole there. And you can see the lines of flux here. And so you can see how they're flat uh, at the equator or close to the equator, which just perpendicular to the, the geomagnetic north pole there. And then how they're inclined in the northern hemisphere. And so that inclination like this gives us an idea of what the latitude was. And so is it reversed or is it normal polarity? And what is the inclination of those grains? If you can line up those pieces of information through geologic time, you may be able to trace where certain continents have been linked together. And so if certain continents have a certain sort of pattern of being in a certain latitude and a certain inclination through time, you can link them together. And that's what they're showing you over here on the right-hand side is for Gondwana, you're looking at the the apparent polar wander path for Gondwana. So all of the southern continents had come together back in the supercontinent um, Rodinia. And when Rodinia broke up, Gondwana stayed together for much of geologic time until the Mesozoic. And in the Mesozoic, everything kind of broke up. And uh, so from the Mesozoic onward, you're going to get a different signature for all of the continents. And so, but before that, they're going to track together along that same sort of path, at least, you know, within the, um, the latitude. <laughs> so, so even in Gondwana, it's a really huge supercontinent, right? And so parts of it would be farther north and farther south would have different inclinations. Okay, so the magnetometers themselves. Um, on uh, slide number 52 here, um, there's a squid magnetometer, a cryogenic magnetometer. We had one of those at KU, a uh, guy uh, who worked on carbonates, had to, to deal with uh, really low magnetic intensities and magnetic susceptibilities. And so his instrument was quite sensitive, and he worked on a cryogenic magnetometer that we set up in Lindley Hall at the time. Uh, you can use what they call an AFD, uh, demagnetometer. That's actually alternating field demagnetometer. And so you can change the field and record the strength of the sample that way. There are ones, I think AFD is one that spins, and so you can change the, the uh, magnetic field that way. Now, I'm not really familiar with squid magnetometer, but it would be something that, uh, Another way to get at the uh, stepwise sort of demagnetization of a sample to record what its intensity and directionality was for these oriented cores. Uh, If you look at the next page, it actually shows you a vibrating and a cryogenic uh, uh, magnetometer. There are different sensitivity and different uses for each of these instruments. Uh, But again, these are very expensive labs. They have to be put together, and the sort of folks who do this sort of work Um, work on large-scale sort of tectonic problems. They work on impact structures and trying to date the apparent polar wander path for an impact structure, perhaps. Um, All interesting sorts of uh, applications for paleomagnetism. On the next slide, 
you can actually see where folks in a stratigraphic setting have gone in and tried to figure out if the polarity is reversed or normal. And so what you see here is, in fact, uh, the signature for today is at the very top up there where we have normal polarity, and that's indicated by the black regions on this uh, diagram. It's called the, the Brunus um, cron, and so these things are called crons, and so this is a magnetic uh, susceptibility, I guess you would call it, uh, sort of chart, of magnetic polarity chart, uh, stratigraphic chart, and it shows you at times when there were, uh, well, like, for instance, the Matayama has mixed polarity, right? So you can have times where it was normal and times where it was reversed. And so the Jaramillo is a normal. The uh, Old Divide is a, is a normal as well. So that's the same as the Old Divide Gorge. And that was about 1.9 um, million years ago. And so you can see that these things are actually tied to a... Uh, uh, age dates on the on the left hand side of this as well, so it's important for paleo uh, magnetomet paleo magicians to work with uh, folks who are isotope geochronologists as well. Okay, so you get normal, reversed, and mixed polarities. So from the Pliocene, that is about two two and a half billion years ago, a million years ago. We've had the Matayama and the Brunus um, events there, or the the Brunus Crons. Uh, so the fundamental unit's called a, a polarity zone, and the polarity zones and the polarity super zones uh, may be recognized. And so on the right-hand side, we're not going to get into much detail on this, but you can see that there are things called subcrons, and uh, just like anything, you can divide it. And so the fundamental unit of this, of course, and these are physical sort of features we're talking about again here. Um, these are going to be the cron, the subcron, and the supercron. And when we talk about the chronologic, the actual age dates, it's the cron, subcron, and supercron as well. So they don't make a distinction between magnetic uh, time units and magnetic units. So it's all time for them. So in the last slide, then, to deal with magnetostratigraphy, we're looking at paleomagnetism. Uh, it's really paleomagnetostratigraphy. It's not really a word right now. But uh, one of the things to keep in mind, here's some of the important events that have happened through geologic time. Now, in that chronostratigraphic, well, the, in the magnetostratigraphic uh, profile that you see on the right-hand side, it's showing you composite. And the Brunus is at the very top up there. So the Brunus up there at the top of the Cenozoic, and you can see the, the KPG boundary right there with the Cenozoic and the Mesozoic right about in the upper 40% of this diagram. If you look in the Cretaceous here now, there's a long, long period of normal polarity in the Cretaceous. And that's probably when the seafloor spreading was really getting going. And uh, they call that the Cretaceous normal supercron. And so that lasted about 40 million years with nothing but, you know, normal polarity. Uh, for the Cayman reverse supercron, it's in the late Carboniferous. It's beyond the diagram at the right there, so it's not shown there. But it last, lasted for more than 50 million years. And the Moyero uh, reverse supercron lasted for another 20 million years. So these things can last a long time sometimes. So um, that's it for magnetostratigraphy. I'm going to take a little break here and uh, come back and we'll start talking about the correlation between what our physical um, lithostratigraphic units as opposed to the time rock units, which are the chronostratigraphic units. And once we get through that, we'll then go back to a physical sort of uh, setting and we'll talk about biostratigraphy. So that's what uh, what's coming up next. Well, this is audio recording number four, and we're going to talk now about the difference between um, lithostratigraphic units and geochronologic units. And uh, so one is conceptual and one is actually based in the material world. So the lithostratigraphic and the lithodemic obviously are material worlds, but chronostratigraphic would be also considered to be a material. Actually, it's conceptual in the sense it's not time, but it's the time rock units, and we're going to pair that to the geochronologic units, which are geochronologic units, which are time-based units. So uh, here we go. Uh, the nature of time. Time is this um, indefinite, continuing process of existence and events that occur in an order 
in uh, apparently irreversible succession. We go from the past to the f what we think is going to become the future, and uh, but it's indefinite. We, we don't have a good definition for what time is, uh, but it's a part of the fundamental structure of the universe. It's a dimension, or at least part of a dimension all on its own, in which um, a sequence of events can occur. So things move, right? So we're all driven by energy. And um, time is neither an event or a thing, and it's uh, hardly, you know, we try to measure it, but of course we know that even gravity affects time as well. So this is a, an argument for uh, philosophers like uh, Leibniz and maybe uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, but uh, so as far as we're concerned, we're going to try to deal with things that are much more maybe easy to understand when we talk about time. We have absolute age dating that we can do with uh, with radiometric uh, techniques, or we can, well, they call it isotope geochronology. And so isotope geochronology is a type of geochronology that's based on uh, the radiometric age dates of uh, uranium-238, uh, for example, or uranium-235, uh, a couple of different systems. You can have samarium neodymium uh, age dates as well, which will tell you about the mantle separation ages. Um, and then the other thing that we do, and this is where geology really had its roots, was in the relative age dating, when people found a series or a sequence of events in the rocks and maybe the fossils in those rocks, and they were able to correlate them from one place to another and using the principles of original horizontality, superposition, and lateral continuity, and in cross-cutting relationships, we were able to determine a relative age dating sort of uh, system for much of geology before we ever had the techniques to be able to do the uh, uh, isotope geochronology. So relative age dating is still important in geology today. Um, as we progress into the future, of course, the geochronology is going to become much more important to, in a way, test the relative age dates that we already have. So when we come to the chronologic uh, uh, units that we have, um, you guys already know this, right? So chronologic units are hierarchical, and you can have a chron at the lowest part, and that's usually associated with a uh, fossil zone, and then age, epoch, period, uh, era, and eon, and so forth. And so you guys are familiar with all of these already. You know, the geochronology is a study of uh, dating events, and the chronostratigraphy, in fact, is the element that deals with time relationships with the ages of rocks. And so that was... And to... Uh, to show you on the next slide, you can actually see um, a photo of the Grand Canyon. It's one of the, the great uh, areas that we can say this is deep time right here, literally in this case. And so we have Precambrian at the base of it, and then, and then we have the Permian at the top of it. And so that's the top of the Paleozoic succession. Well, in this area anyway, the top of the Paleozoic succession. So we have the entirety of the Paleozoic preserved here in the Grand Canyon with a few unconformities that remove some of the rock units, <laughs> sadly. But, um, but you know, several thousand feet of rock here. And uh, if we go on to the next one, it shows you that correlation between geochronologic units and chronostratigraphic units. And there's absolutely no relationship, of course, with the lithostratigraphic units. And so, of course, we know that some groups have a chronostratigraphic age attached to them, however. And so that is the connection between them, but it's not a one-to-one -one sort of correlation. So we have, uh, you know, the five or so ranks of lithostratigraphic units, but bearing no uh, relationship to the chronostratigraphic or the geochronologic uh, units. But the geochronologic units and the ge chronostratigraphics have that correlation. So chron goes with chronozone, age with stage, epic with series, period with system, era with erythem, and eon with eonothem. Um, but um, but not so much with lithostratigraphy. So the chronostratigraphy, of course, is uh, they want to put absolute age dates on everything if it's possible. Um, should an isoch isochronous actually means equal time? Should should these be um, isochronous units? Um, why do I have a question mark at that? Yeah, they should be isochronous units. It should be the same time. What's the difference between synchronous and isochronous? Well, isochronous actually refers to a length of time, and synchronous means an event, essentially, that is the same time. 
Um, so isochronous would be equal duration of time, I guess you could say, as opposed to diachronous, which cuts across time, right? So much of chronostratigraphy and the Phanerozoic e uh, eonothem is based on fossils. And you can't do that earlier because you just don't have good enough fossil control in the Ediacaran or, or and especially anything before that. Uh, the Precambrian units usually have isotope geochronology. So that really became fashionable in the late 1960s and the early 1970s uh, when people began to use mass spectrometers to measure the um, uranium-238 and uranium-235 and their daughter products to establish uh, absolute age dates. And so those are called uh, geo geochronologic terms, of course, uh, that we have there. So if you look at the GSA uh, time scale and the IUGS time scale, you can see that they actually apply that chronostratigraphic. The chronostratigraphy is, is um, the geochronology is applied to each of those uh, time scales. The chronostratigraphy, yeah, I'm going to check this out right now. Yeah, so I just had to go confirm this. Uh, the GSA is obviously a time scale. But for the International uh, Union of, of, of um, the International Commission on Stratigraphy publishes the IUGS time scale. And for 2019, they actually use both time and they use chronostratigraphic units as well. So they list it as eonothem and eon. So they give the chronostratigraphic name and then the uh, uh, time period afterwards, right? And so... And they do that for uh, age and stage and so forth. And so it lists all the ages and stages, whereas the um, GSA uh, chart does not. So, but anyway, that's, uh, that's how the, the time gets parsed between two international agencies that deal with geology. So between GSA and IUGS, things don't always jive. Um, but anyway, the IUGS was responsible for the International Commission on Stratigraphy, and so that's what we deal with here in the United States still when we look at the designation of the chronostratigraphic units. And so um, if chronostratigraphy, if the goal is to uh, establish uh, absolute age dates um, for, excuse me, for geochronology, uh, if we can have absolute age dates that we can put to the uh, stratigraphic column, that's great. Here is the, uh, in slide number 64, uh, there's a, a list of current GSSPs. Now, GSSP is a global stratotype, global boundary stratotype. They don't include the B in the, um, in the acronym there, but it's a global stratotype section and point, but it's really a global boundary stratotype section and point. Um, and, the, and when it's plural like this, you'll have sections and points then added to it. But if we said, what's the base of the Cambrian? Well, there's an area defined for that. And it's one single section. And within that section, there is a point where they drive what they colloquial, colloquially call the golden spike. And uh, that's where they would establish then the base of the Cambrian. There's another one where they establish the base of the Ordovician. And then for the smaller units, for the series, uh, so in the Cambrian, there's several uh, series that have been defined. Terra Novan is one, for instance. So what's the base of the Terra Novan? Uh, and what's the base of the Zhangshanian? What's the base of the Ferongian? These are all terms that relate to places from China that are the type areas for these sorts of features, um, these sorts of, of, of chronostratigraphic units. So um, this actually lists the current GSSPs, of course, this website here uh, that is a link. And so that's, that's one of the goals of this international uh, body of stratigraphers. And it's comprised of both paleontologists and physical stratigraphers, but dominantly by paleontologists, because many of these time units in the Phanerozoic, of course, are defined by the by the biology, really, when it comes right down to it. What are the, the fossils that characterize that certain boundary? So they try to argue for what is the best for science, and they don't always get it right. And so you can talk to Dr. Miller about this, but uh, he's worked on the Cambrian Ordovician boundary, or the base of the Cambrian, for a long period of time. And uh, they probably did not pick the best um, interval 
for that boundary, and they certainly didn't pick the best uh, section, at least in his opinion, for either of those sort of uh, things. Now, he, as it turns out, he actually wound up proposing the time interval that was used for the base of the Cambrian. So he's kind of famous that way, I guess you could say. It's the base of Iapetonathus fluctivagus, which is a type of conodont. And uh, so anyway, uh, you can talk to him more uh, when he comes back f uh, into the office uh, later on this semester. But GSSPs are pretty important. The other thing is because a GSSP may not be very applicable everywhere around the world, you can also designate what's called an ASSP, which is a auxiliary boundary stratotype section and point. And so that's uh, one of the things that we've done uh, with, uh, with the Ordovician, in fact, the base of the Ordovician. So GSSP uh, for the base of the Ordovician it should have been um, placed probably a little bit lower, according to Dr. Miller. Um, it should have been placed at Cordylotus andrasi in the Lawson Cove section, which Dr. Miller has been working on since 1989, I think it was. I've helped him substantially substantially, excuse me, I've got the hiccups, uh, substantially on that project. And uh, you'll find that it's now an ASSP uh, with that link at the bottom there. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can actually see how some of these things correlate, and some of them have worldwide distributions. So uh, here's the Cordylotus andrasi zone. You can see here it's the base of a fossil zone called Eurekia popsis. That's a trilobite. And... Um, and there's several other sort of uh, um, organisms that, that show up there as well. So uh, Cordylotus andrasi happens to be at the very bottom of Hirsutodontus hirsutus um, zone, conodont zone. Um, so this is kind of neat, um, how you can use fossils to indicate the ages of rocks because we think of fossils as evolving because evolution is pretty much an event that takes a finite length of time, but... Um, but in the rock record, it may not be very uh, thick interval. And so that's pretty important then. So each one of these uh, conodonts that Dr. Miller's worked on is uh, what would be, would be referred to as a, an index fossil because they have a, a wide geographic distribution and a short um, taxon time range or, or a short biozone range. Uh, so if you look at the next uh, slide, you'll actually see a photograph of what it looks like. It's much less than a millimeter in length. In fact, it's probably like about a tenth of a millimeter in length, and that's the Cordylotus andrasi uh, conodon element, which defines the base of Cordylotus andrasi. Now, again, that was not the one that was chosen for the base of the Ordovician. The base of the Ordovician is a conodon called Iapetonathus fluctivagus. So anyway, um, that's the application of fossils to the, the record, uh, to the stratigraphic record, and that's chronostratigraphy. So some people even refer to it as biochronostratigraphy because it separates and then out the biozones that are important in establishing, you know, what's the base of this series? What's the base of this system? What's the base of uh, this stage? And so that's what's used to do it in these uh, fossils like this. Okay, on now to biostratigraphy. I wanted to throw in that sort of non-material sort of discussion before we got to fossils because we're going to talk about fossils in a little bit more detail. Um, so for fossils, we're actually looking at, um, it's probably the second most important type of stratigraphy you can do, with the first being the lithostratigraphy, just defining what rocks are where. Uh, for this, we're defining what, you know, fossils you find within stratigraphic successions around the world. And uh, so for this, we're going to have biozones, and we're also going to have subzones within those biozones. So it's equivalent to a formation in a member. So a biozone is the fundamental unit of, of biostratigraphy. And then there are several types of biozones. And so these biozones um, are, are defined, and we'll define those here in just a minute. I'm going to take a little break here, and, um, and I'll have this uh, biostratigraphy and the rest of this, the types of biozones, on the next uh, audio recording. So here we go into biostratigraphy. 
Um, so if we have biozones and sub-biozones, uh, we also have several types of biozones as well. Uh, the range zone could be two varieties, actually, if there are five types of biozone. The taxon range biozone and the concurrent range biozone are regarded as range uh, biozones. And so taxon range would be an individual taxon, uh, an individual species that we find in the fossil record. And how does it correlate from one section to another? And again, it can cross timelines. If it does cross timelines, as best we can tell, then it's not going to be useful for chronostratigraphy. But if it seems to be fairly isochronous or if it seems to be fairly synchronous in its appearance, then that would be perhaps a good um, a fossil then to use as a, a chronostratigraphic marker. So, but in this case, range zones, two, di two different varieties, the taxon range and then the concurrent range. Uh, for the interval uh, range biozone, we'll talk about that and we'll talk, talk about all of these in more detail here in just a little bit. Uh, the lineage biozone and then also the assemblage biozone and then there's an abundance biozone. Formerly, those were called acme zones or peak biozones. Um, so on to the next slide. This is slide number 69 here. Uh, always keep in mind that biostratigraphy is independent of lithostratigraphy, so you can find fossils across contacts sometimes in certain situations. Sometimes fossils can actually be facies dependent as well, so we call those things biofacies fossils if you want, uh, but it's not as, as useful for biostratigraphy then if it is uh, a biofacies dependent fossil. Uh, so these are independent of lithostratigraphy, however, and so um, independent of chronostratigraphy as well, so they can cross the time zones, of course. Um, but they're also useful for defining those GSSPs, so the first occurrence of a new lineage, perhaps, might be a very useful origination, uh, species origination, in order to like mark that in the, in the geologic record, if you at least find it fairly widespread and if it seems to be consistent uh, throughout the record, if it occurs before. Uh, certain species and then after other certain species that it, it could be quite useful um, Like the contacts and uh, contacts and lithostratigraphy these things can be diachronous however, but they may be sometimes synchronous and so um, it's important to, uh, to to establish if they are um, If you can okay, so before we get going into the the biozones and we look at those in more detail We're going to talk about what a species is first. It's defined as an interbreeding population of Similar individuals and so you have to have viable offspring is the other part of that um, They are the principal natural taxonomic unit as well. So a species um, if you recall from historical it goes from uh, genus and species actually define what a species is okay so we're homo sapiens as human beings uh, there have been other homo sapiens or excuse me other human beings that would be like homo erectus or homo neanderthalensis or homo uh, heidelbergensis those are all types of uh, humans if you will but they're not the same species as us as best we understand it um and so do they interbreed well yeah sometimes yeah some people think that we have uh, up to 3% uh, Neanderthal genes in us. So is it actually viable to regard Neanderthalensis as a species or a subspecies? Well, you know, if we interbreed, it's probably a subspecies then, right? And so Denosovans are another uh, a group of extinct humanoids that uh, we no longer have around with us, but uh, we were able to interbreed with them as well. So their genes are actually manifest in modern humans uh, also. So probably different uh, subspecies, if you will. Um, but like Homo erectus, uh, would we be able to interbreed with Homo erectus? I'm not sure. So there are other types of uh, uh, things. And so anyway, it's it's kind of a, um, more of a web than it is a direct linear sort of uh, trend for species, you know. Um, but anyway, the species consists of the genus and the species. Uh, so that's called the specific name when you put those two together. So um, we regard the genus as being a higher category then, and so you can have other species of that genus. And then all uh, genera, the plural of genus, 
are um, can can be assigned to families as well. So you can have families or subfamilies or super families, and families. If uh, you get enough of them together, you can put those into a class. And if there are enough classes, you put that into an order. And so it actually kind of flows the other direction from uh, domain to kingdom to phylum to class or order and class. King phylum. Yeah, maybe maybe class and order are out of uh, sequence here. So I'm going to change that for you. So, uh, but anyway, kingdom phylum class order. So now it is actually appropriately uh, listed in the um, in the presentation here. Um, but I've actually gone from the smallest to the largest here. So the natural small one is the lowest uh, hierarchy, and the highest, of course, would be domain here. Uh, some people actually have a, a term they use called realm. Uh, so when you get out to the far reaches of uh, classifying organisms that we begin to wonder if some things were actually alive or not. And so is a virus alive, for, in, for example? Um, so can we detect if fossils were interbreeding? No. So we have to look at what we call characters in those fossils. And so how many spines does it have? How many bumps on a certain region of that animal does it have? Does it have a certain different type of geometry to its skeletal or exoskeletal structure? And so those are the things we look at in the, in the biological record. Um, this whole... Um, type of science that people do when you try to classify organisms in paleontology, it's called systematics and taxonomy. So the systematics is looking at the relationships and making inferences or interpretations then and what those phylogenetic uh, relationships are. And so on the next page, you can actually see one of the techniques that people use here. It's called cladistic analysis, and, and they form what they call cladograms here. And so you see branches in the cladogram, which don't necessarily mean speciation or uh, macroevolution sort of uh, events, but what it, what it actually is, is that's a, a node, if you will, and those nodes separate uh, the shared common characteristics for each of those branches. And so there are shared common characteristics, for example, between the shark, the salmon, and the lizard here, and that would be two jaws and a pair of fins, at least one pair of fins. If you look at the lamprey, which is a type of eel, right, it has a rasping tongue. Well, you don't see that with the other types of uh, organisms that are in this cladogram. And so they've tried to lump these things together with, um, with the common characteristics. And so when you finally get up to salmon and lizards, salmon are more closely related to lizards, of course, because they're osteoichthys, as you, if you may recall from historical a bony fish as opposed to a cartilaginous fish like the shark, and so the salmon are more closely related to lizards because of that. Um, so we have these sorts of techniques that we use even with organisms like the uh, trilobites that you see on the right-hand side here. Obviously, trilobites are all arthropods, but there are some that were blind, that didn't have eyes, and some that did have eyes and free cheeks. And other sorts of things like certain number of plural lobes, perhaps, or a certain um, uh, shape of their tail or their pygidium, a certain shape on their cephalon, perhaps, a certain number of furrows or grooves in their uh, glabella, which is that sort of like central part that's at the the north end of the uh, of the axial lobe here, right? It runs right through the middle, and the plural lobes are off the sides there. So those are all characters that you would use then to describe um, a, a specific type of uh, species of trilobite, and people know them very well. They've been describing these things for hundreds of years now. Um, so let's go on now. So that's a background in the biology of it. Let's talk about the range biozone first. So the range biozone. Uh, it occurs within a body of rock representing a known stratigraphic and geographic context. And it may be a part of an animal, or it could be the entire animal, or just the exoskeleton, perhaps. And there are two types, once again. If you take a single taxon and record its occurrence within a stratigraphic succession, you have made a taxon biozone. That's a single taxon. So one species, and you see that it occurs first it has what we call a first appearance datum in a stratigraphic column. Um, the stratigraphic section, a measured and described stratigraphic section, it has a first occurrence and it has a last occurrence or a last appearance datum in that. So FAD and LAD 
our shorthand for first, occur, uh, first appearance datum and a last appearance datum would be the LAD. Um, you can also have concurrent range biozones. So if you had two species that overlapped, the, the overlap between them would be considered to be concurrent. So they're both there at the same time. So concurrent uh, range zone is another type of, of range biozone, if you will, yeah, where they happen to overlap. And so the next diagram shows uh, the distinction between those two. Now, I have to explain these diagrams. Uh, these actually come directly from the code, and so what they show on here are the time surfaces or individual events as time one and time two, which would be the, the one above, on each side, okay, in each one of these diagrams. So the timelines are shown there, and they're showing you that these um, species do not occur at the same time. Their, their FAD is not at the same time, and their LAD is not at the same time. And so what they're showing you here is that it is diachronous. This is a species that has a diachronous occurrence within four stratigraphic sections. So the stratigraphic sections are labeled with a capital A, capital B, capital C, and capital D. In this case, they're actually identifying the species with just a, a lowercase a. And so the lowercase a. And so you can see how the uh, little carrots or the... Um, uh, the, the, the essentially, the stick indicates the range in between there. Are you going to find it in every single rock? Perhaps not, but you can find maybe the first occurrence. So it doesn't mean if you just find the first appearance datum in, in, in a rock, maybe you should look lower, and uh, you might find it a little bit lower in, in that section. So anyway, they show you where uh, species A can be correlated from section A to B to C to D and so forth. Uh, in this rock succession here. So that's a taxon range zone. If you look on the right hand side, you can see the concurrent range zone and you can see where A and B overlap. Uh, that defines that concurrence and that concurrence may not be, uh, may be diachronous as well. Uh, but you may have some more, um, you know, maybe a little bit more of a robust signal. Of course, it de depends then on identifying two species within a stratigraphic section. Here they only show two stratigraphic sections, uh, capital A and capital B, with species A and species B that occur within A, and species A and B occur within B as well. If you didn't have B there, you wouldn't have a concurrent range zone for that stratigraphic section. So those are all uh, types of range biozones, you know, two types of range biozones. If we go on to the next slide, you can actually see an interval biozone, which it's easy to confuse this with a concurrent biozone. But what I'm going to show you in the next slide will actually make it more, uh, more apparent uh, as to what these things actually are. But let me go ahead and give you the definition here. I'll just read it to you. It's an interval biozone is a body of rock between two specified biostratigraphic uh, surfaces, the features of which biozones, biohorizons, are commonly based, uh, include the lowest occurrence or the highest occurrence, distinctive occurrences, or changes in the character of an individual taxon, um, or taxa, multiple. So what you see in the next uh, section is there are three sections on the right and two set, excuse me, two sections on the right, three sections on the left here. And they're showing you the first occurrence for A and the last occurrence of B. So that's not concurrent, right? So there are parts of that interval where you don't get B. And so it can't be regarded as a concurrent range zone then, can it? So what we have instead is the 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 base of one and the top of another taxon range zone and where they overlap plus that little extra bit is the first occurrence for A in this case. Um, so the first occurrence of A up to the last occurrence of B would call, be called a uh, an interval biozone. So the interval being exactly that, the first occurrence of A and the last occurrence of B. So FAD of A and the LAD of B, an interval time zone. So if they don't overlap, uh, completely necessarily. And they show you three circumstances here in three different successions. Now the, the next one actually shows you the last occurrence of a fossil, uh, A, and then the last occurrence of B. And so that's another way to define a uh, interval biozone. So both the right and the left hand sides are types of interval biozones. Uh, 
most commonly, most commonly, most people look for the first occurrences when you look at um, biozones, but it isn't always defined that way. So that's the interval biozone, not to be confused with a range biozone. Okay, so the next one is referred to as a lineage biozone. It's a body of rock containing species that represent a specific segment of an evolutionary lineage. So a branch, if you will, of certain animals that occur or um, and that, that evolve through time. And so in this case, they're actually showing you that uh, these intervals likely are going to have more time significance than what either the range biozone or the interval biozones have. And uh, what they're showing you here are uh, uh, an evolutionary succession of A, B, and C, which belong to the same lineage. And A, B, and C in, in section M and N here, um, where you can see that there's a, uh, the occurrence of B through here maybe some sort of evolutionary event. And so that's a lineage biozone here. Uh, when you go to the next one, uh, that's on the right-hand side here in B. They're showing you how these things actually speciate, and they don't necessarily evolve. They, they call that pseudo, uh, oh, what do they call it? It's, it's like pseudo um, extinction when like B no longer exists, but C is there, right? And so it, it's apparent if they have enough characteristics in common, most people think it gave rise to a new species then. So those are speciation events that they're showing you on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, they're showing you the, the, the evolutionary tree, essentially, for these things. And so X continues, Y continues even into Z, but they think that these are closely related enough that they regard them as uh, speciation events that would occur in Y and and later in Z, in both uh, sections R and S here. And so uh, in this case, they're making a, a lineage biozone just out of that interval that has the origination of Y to the base of the origination of Z. And again, they don't show cutting the timelines because it's less likely to when you have evolutionary events. So the things that are really important in evolution, of course, are the originations and also the, um, the evolutionary events, and then also the extinctions. So on to the next uh, variety of biozone, that's the assemblage biozone, and this is one of the more common uh, varieties that we have in the geologic record. Uh, so an assemblage biozone is a body of rock characterized by unique association of three or more taxa, the association of which distinguishes it from a biostratigraphic character uh, from, from adjacent strata. Um, so what's above or what's below. An assemblage zone may be based on a single taxonomic group, for example, trilobites, or it may include uh, more than one group, such as acrotarchs or uh, chitinozoans. So here we have in the next slide, this is slide number 79, an assemblage zone. And so what they're showing you here is uh, several taxa that occur within these two sections, A and B, and where they occur, they're showing you is like where A occurs and B occurs and C occurs. And, and actually, uh, D and E, actually E doesn't occur right at the base of that. And so we could define that assemblage zone based on, and, and, and even if you get farther out, so when you get to I, I actually occurs, well, pretty close to the base, I guess, there. But uh, the ones that are most important, in fact, are everything but E in this uh, succession here. But you can see where E ends. That's pretty important because that becomes the top of that assemblage biozone. Okay, if we look at the right-hand side in section B, you know, the, the record's not quite the same. Uh, and you can see here also where it crosses a timeline as well in between sections A and B in that assemblage. And so... It's a random group of fossil that you would use, fossils that you would use then to define an assemblage biozone. But an assemblage, three or more uh, taxa that are used to uh, do that. Okay, on to the uh, abundance biozone. They used to call these acme zones. And um, so let me just read it to you here in abundance. The biozone is a body of rock in which, and notice it's a body of rock, we're talking about biostratigraphy now, is uh, in which an abundance of a particular taxon or a specific group of taxa is significantly greater than that of the adjacent parts of the section. Abundance biozones may be limited 
uh, of local utility because of the abundance of the tax and the geologic record, larger control by paleoecology, taphonomy, which is um, how are they preserved, and diagenesis, how are they affected by the rock forming processes. Uh, the only way to identify a particular abundance zone is to trace it laterally. And so what they've done in the next diagram is they've shown you two biozones here that are uh, uh, abundant zones, and so there's a, a zone low down, and there's a zone up higher uh, that happened to be, in this case, right across the uh, timelines as well. Uh, but they're showing you the same species in each case. So A is most abundant in section A up at the top of this, uh, where the, the top timeline is, the, the, the last or the youngest timeline is. And then they're showing you abundance in two intervals in section B and a lower interval in section C, but all of the same species in this case. So where do they occur most commonly? Where do you find the most of them? And that would be used for an abundance biozone. Okay, so there are other ones that we can apply now. So if you know of the five or the five plus the subdivisions of some, um, like the taxon biozone or ta taxon range biozone or the concurrent range biozone, um, you can make hybrids out of this, and so they allow for you define it, but as long as you're specific about how you define a biozone, it can become, well, a biozone. And so that's the hybrid or, or new kinds of biozones. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. And what you see here is a photograph. Now, if you recall, a former graduate student in our department named Wes uh, Weikert, he worked on rocks out in the Great Basin. I was his advisor for his uh, master's thesis. And actually, he won the, um, the best thesis award uh, in 2017 for his, uh, his work out here. What you see here are a group of rocks that crop out in the uh, north end of the, of the uh, Shell Creek Range. And in fact, what you see here, the, there's a big giant thrust fault off to the left-hand side of this about half a mile away called the Shell Creek Thrust Zone. This is on the lower plate then, and these rocks are all dipping towards that thrust. And what you see here are some Upper Cambrian age rocks, or Upper Cambrian rocks. They're late Cambrian in age. And they belong to a, a time interval that's been recognized previously as the Steptoan um, stage and above that above the irving ella major zone that you see uh, shown between the two white lines there above that it's called the sun wapiton uh, stage and so these uh, fossils have been used to define stages in the geologic past well in the in the past not the recent past <laughs> um, so these rocks include Elvinia zones. So Elvinia zone, I'll show you some trilobites from this zone. So trilobites are really important in this interval. It's before you really get the conodonts. There are only a few paraconodonts that exist down in these rocks. And so they're not as good for biostratigraphic zonation as the trilobites. So the trilobite's really important in this interval. So Irving Ella Major zone here you can see is a very, very thin zone compared to Elvinia zone, which goes off to the right-hand side off, the, uh, off of this image. But those are some rocks that Wes Weikert looked at. They're very cyclic in that upper part there, you can see. And uh, lithostratigraphically, what you're looking at here is the uh, Dunderberg Shale on the right-hand side, that big, massive uh, limestone cliff there, which is about maybe 100 feet thick, maybe not quite that much, 85 feet thick, uh, all the way into Irving Ella Major. Um, that is um, called the Barton Canyon member of the windfall formation. And above that is the Catlin member of the windfall formation. So that's in the, above the second of the two white lines that cut across there up to the top of the peak there. And then of course it's removed by erosion above that. Okay, so the next slide shows you the same interval in a, in a little bit more detail. So I could have put teeny cephalus on the last slide because that's what's above Irving Ella Major, but uh, the clouds were there so it'd make it difficult to read it. Uh, but uh, the teeny cephalozone zone is the top of this interval. But let's start in stratigraphic. When we talk about starting in stratigraphic order, you start at the bottom and then you work your way up. So there are three fossil zones at the very bottom and the lower right hand of this interval that are referred to as aphalaspis, dicanthopygian, prehousia, all types of trilobites. 
uh, a genera of trilobites. And then you get to Dunderbergia zone, which is exposed in the Canlan Shale, which is at the bottom of this interval. So the Canlan Shale is shown here. And that's part of Dunderbergia zone. And Dunderbergia zone goes up to within the top meter of the Johns Wash limestone, which crops out across the middle of this photograph. If you get a little higher, uh, you see that the Elvinia zone picks up right at near the top of the Johns Wash, and it goes all the way up again to Irving Ella Major zone, which is that thin interval up in that cyclic succession at the top. Right in the middle of this, there is a first occurrence within the middle of the Elvinia zone is the first occurrence of Irving Ella and Gusta Lombata. Yeah, that's a, that's a mouthful there, but it's a polymeroid trilobite that co-occurs with an agnostid trilobite known as Agnostoides Stodes orientalis, and um, which marks the base of what's called the Zhangshanian stage in chronostratigraphy, and it's also a sequence boundary at this location, uh, and that's based on physical evidence in the lithostratigraphy. And so uh, this is a project I'm working on with some other folks uh, out at the University of Kansas, and uh, potentially with some folks out of uh, Oklahoma, o University of Oklahoma and uh, Iowa. But anyway, it's an important time interval worldwide, the base of the Zhang Shanian, which is that yellow line that you see right in the middle of the Corset Spring Shale. Okay, so the rock units here, the coral, you know, well, they don't correlate with this, but they're the, the rocks that uh, contain these fossils, so the Irving Ella Major zone. So you can see Irving Ella Major there in the photograph. Um, so that is the, uh, what you saw was the Barton Canyon. The last slide there, this is actually the Sneakover formation here. So the Sneakover goes from um, sort of the first uh, carbonate that you see cropping out in the uh, profile of this section all the way up into uh, the base of that cliff that's just above there, and that's the... Uh, the base of the uh, Hella Mariah member of the Notch Peak formation there. So you saw that previously in the lithostratigraphic slide. Um, in this case, the uh, Hella Mariah is not the base of Tinicephalus zone. Tinicephalus actually begins in the Sneakover limestone. Okay, let's go on to the next slide here. This shows you the location where these uh, sections were uh, measured and described. And so that's actually in the west central part. You see where the roughly where the eye is in Great Basin. That's about where the section is that you just saw. And right about where the A is uh, in Basin is where the northern Shell Creek uh, range is on the Nevada side of the Great Basin. Okay, so there was a guy back in the 1960s. He started in about 1960 with the U.S. Geological Survey. He was a trilobite biostratigrapher, and he began working on some rocks out in the Great Basin um, and looking at the trilobites that were there. So he measured a lot of stratigraphic sections, and he collected trilobites. And then for the USGS, he published a couple of landmark publications, one of which was the Trilobites of the Lake Cambrian Terracephalid Biomere, in the Great Basin, United States. And so um, uh, Palmer, 1965, defined what he referred to as biomeres. And so a biomere is a collection of trilobites that belong to the same family, mostly the same family. And so in this case, it's the Alvinia D and, uh, and also some of the uh, Terracephala D. And so between those two, they're kind of combined uh, together. That would form the Terracephalid biomere. P-T-E-R-O, cephalid. Tero, P-T-E-R-O, means square. Ceph means head, or cephalus, right? So cephalus means head. So square head, trilobites. So these are the square heads right here. So in that interval, you, he shows you here where he collected the trilobites at certain intervals. That's the, uh, the squares, essentially, and he combines those together to form lines that are relatively thick, but there's only a handful of intervals where he found trilobites in, these, on, in all of these sections. And so what you see on the right-hand side here is one section. Okay, I have to describe this, actually, so you can see where he collected the trilobites in the lower part of that section on the left-hand side. And then the upper part of that section you can see on the right-hand side. As it turns out, these rocks had already been looked at by 
Dr. Jim Miller. And so Jim Miller, when he was out here, he tried to collect conodonts from this, not knowing at the time that conodonts didn't occur that low. And so he worked, he's done a lot of work out here. Uh, but anyway, this is the uh, McGill section. And the McGill section later became the type section for a chronostratigraphic interval that was proposed called the Steptoan stage. And so the pterocephalid biomere and the Steptoan stage are roughly coincident, um, which a lot of people were upset that somebody else would come along and try to make a chronostratigraphic interval out of that uh, when they weren't consulted. And those would include people like Pete Palmer <laughs> and Jim Miller. Um, what you see here on the next photograph, and this is slide number 86 here, this is a, a photograph of the lower part of that section in uh, McGill here. And so the base of the section is off to the left and the top of the section is off to the right, kind of up that uh, saddle and up to a little peak that's up here. And so this is uh, a photograph, actually. That's uh, Rebecca Freeman from the University of Kentucky. She's a lingulate brachiopod, well, actually uh, an inarticulate or organophosphate brachiopod specialist and so she dissolves the limestone in order to get out the brachiopods well here she's trying to collect this entire interval um, at the lower uh, section of McGill here um, and you can see actually McGill is in the distance the town of McGill in the Steptoe Valley here on the on the valley opposite you can see the uh, on the opposite side you can see the mountain range over there and that's called the North Egan Range on the opposite side and you can see the South Egan range in the far far distance under the word Nevada okay so that is what it looks like to have a stratigraphic succession where you would collect trilobites out of it in this case maybe collecting brachiopods out of it as well in the next slide you can actually see a composite uh, range zone for all of the tr different trilobites that occur in that pterocephalid biomere interval now you only see a photograph on the last page here, and that section's probably about 800 feet thick. Um, here's the trilobites that occur there, and they're all listed out, and there's over 50 of them. So that's the sort of work that Pete Palmer did. And so in 1965, you go to slide number 88 now, we're looking at what is the lower part of this interval. So aphalaspis is the lower fossil zone within the pterocephalid biomere. So it's a uh, collection of trilobites that are put into, so in other words, this is one of those sort of things that people defined as a hybrid. Uh, it's, it's a family ex level extinction events that kind of bracket this interval. So aphalaspis occurs just above an extinction and uh, you can see what the heads and tails look like there and they show you different kinds of uh, fossils that and this is his interpretation of how he thinks that they evolved into other species and so prehousia well, dicanthopygy first and then prehousia came out of the Af aphalaspis lineage here and on the right hand side you can see aphalaspis um, changing forms in the in the uh, Pagidia and changing forms in the, in the cephalon, the glabella sort of uh, region as well. And so this is his idea of uh, an evol evolutionary tree, but he's also put on here the zones. And so these are actually biozones. And in this case, they're going to be uh, interval biozones, right? And so it's going to be the, the last occurrence of a certain f uh, type of, or the first occurrence of a certain type of uh, fossil. And he, and he changes those a little bit. Um, here we have on the next slide uh, the continuation of these fossils through time and you can see here where uh, where di uh, Dunderbergia gives rise to these other sorts of, uh, of trilobites up through here and eventually up to Elvinia romeri at the very top up there and so he thinks that uh, uh, Dunderbergia would be related then to uh, Elvinia eventually here. You can see some of the tails and so forth also also on the right hand side here. When you get to Alvinia zone, we're talking about slide nine, 90 here, or excuse me, 90. And uh, so we're looking at Dunderbergia giving rise to Alvinia and you can see Alvinia romeri. And then you also see Alvinia um, um, giving rise then eventually to the Irvingella um, uh, types of trilobites. He did an incredible sort of uh, piece of work here. And so on slide 91, it defines what a biomere is. It's a biostratigraphic interval bounded by abrupt non-evolutionary changes. And that's what it really, it's talking about uh, extinction events here, trilobite extinctions. 
of the dominant elements, elements of a single phylum. So the trilobites, more or less, an entire family goes extinct there at the top. At the top of, um, and actually it's right near the base of Irving Ella Major. So Irving Ella Major records a new uh, evolutionary event, more or less. They're kind of related to the uh, uh, Elvinians. Um, so biomeres were a new type of interval that was introduced. But the biomere itself was has an extinction at the bottom, an extinction at the top. And people divided these things into stages then. So there was this first a flowering of, of different species, and that's what you see at the aphalaspa zone. Above that, there's stasis that goes on. And above that, there's kind of like a climax sort of community that develops that would be in uh, Elvinia zone. And then there's a crisis interval, and that's the fourth stage. And so stage four then became um, what was probably the extinction event. And so the extinction event occurs there. Nobody knows exactly what caused the extinctions. It could be a meteorite impact somewhere else around the world, or it could be an ocean anoxia event, uh, these OAEs that occur later on in the geologic record. But there's at least four of these biomeres that are found in the, in the Lake Cambrian. So even if you don't have conodonts, there's this incredible amount of biostratigraphic control. Remember, we're in an area in, in the western part of North America that was rapidly subsiding west of the hinge line, and so you get enormously thick successions out there. Several kilometers of rock are recorded in the upper, Cam in the middle and upper Cambrian. Um, most folks that thinks uh, that um, have uh, other folks have proposed then uh, based on those biomere, the concept of a biomere. They, this is a, a guy named uh, Ludwig and Westrup, who came up with the idea that. Uh, that the, you should call these things actual stages. Why stop with calling these things biomeres? And so they, they named the Marjuman, Marjuman the uh, Steptoan and the Sun Wapaton stages after these trilobite families uh, that existed within that interval. And so on to slide uh, 92, you can actually see how these things correlate with the biomeres on the right-hand side. So they're slightly offset because they regarded the stages as occurring within the crisis intervals. And so the actual boundary between the uh, stages is at the base of stage four, essentially, in the biomeres that are shown on the right. And this shows you also the, the dominant, uh, they don't put in here Prehausia, but there's Aphalaspis, Dicanthopygia, Dunderbergia, and Elvinia that they show here. Prehausia is another uh, biomere, uh, a biozone that would occur below Dicanthopygia. And so, that's the correlation of these things. And now the last slide, this is slide 93. Uh, so we're finally almost finished up with this uh, introduction to the stratigraphic code. Um, within the Pterosophila biomere, there are all these trilobites. And this is just kind of a snapshot of what you see here. And so uh, among these are Angusta, well, Irvingella Angusta lombata and this Agnostoides. Uh, orientalis, and so that's going to be the ones that are the base of the Zhang Shanian. That's going to be a globally recognized interval, um, kind of important. So anyway, the stratigraphic code was proposed by the North American Code for Stratigraphic Nomenclature. I think it was back in 1959 originally, and then it was redone in, in 1983 and then uh, repackaged yet again in 2005. So this is the third version of the code that's available right now. Um, so the, we just call it the code in stratigraphy, and so this is stratigraphic code is another name we can use for it as well. Um, they define the rules by which we, we describe the things that we see in the natural world the rocks that we see there, and then also some of the non-material concepts, like about geologic time and how we def define geochronology, uh, the crones, the supercrones, and so forth, and and, um, and subcrones. So uh, it's a pretty important aspect of, of geology and a pretty important aspect especially of stratigraphy since we had to define rules for it. It gives people a basis. Now, the North American Code of Stratigraphic Nomenclature was published for North Americans. There is an international code that was actually started a long time ago by an American, actually, Hollis Hedberg. And so there are other rules that govern other parts of the world. But Americans 
American geologists didn't want to have to deal with some of the problems that were faced by British geologists early on because they would name rocks like the coal measures. Well, how do you define the coal measures? Well, it was never written down. It was just an idea that was presented as a talk in the uh, Fellows of the Royal Society, perhaps. And so there's a whole bunch of, of um, more rigorous rules that we follow now about how we define what is a stratigraphic unit, what is a biozone, what is a, a magnetostratigraphic unit, and so forth. And so this is just kind of an introduction to it. We're also going to do um, a lab on this, and it's not. And so we'll actually do a biostratigraphy lab and actually lithostratigraphy lab looking at the code. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the stratigraphic code. Again, it's one of the first times I've ever recorded lectures, so please bear with me, and I'm not going to try to clean these things up or edit them in any way. It's, this is like just a work in progress. So, But